Welcome to Keep What You Earn, your judgment and jargon-free zone for entrepreneurs of all levels. Get ready to learn how to scale your business, save money in taxes, and create a business that grows your wealth. If it feels like the financial side of business is like eating your vegetables, well then think of this podcast as the ranch dressing to make the process a little more enjoyable. My name is Shannon Weinstein. I'm a CPA and business owner on a mission to simplify money and empower others through knowledge. I hope this episode inspires you to take action, but remember that the information we share is for educational purposes only and is not individual tax advice. Now that we got that out of the way, let's start the show. So you guys know that I love to chat about all things mindset, even when it comes to the tactics and the strategies and the the metrics and the measurements. We love to talk about the mindset that goes into all those things because what I didn't realize when I started my business was how imperative, how valuable it is to get kind of your head right before you really tackle the difficult tasks. And this is no exception, today's episode and what we're going to talk about. So today I'm welcoming on the show, Carlin Bushman. Now, Carlin has a background as a former corporate executive and a small business owner. She has a deep understanding of the challenges and complexities that come with starting and running a business. And she successfully climbed the corporate ladder and built several small businesses from the ground up, honing her skills in marketing, management, technology, and financials along the way. And now she's using her wealth of experience and knowledge to empower small and medium-sized women-owned businesses to achieve reliable and sustainable revenue streams. Through her guidance and mentorship, Carlin is helping these businesses thrive and reach their full potential. And what she's going to do today with me is we're going to unpack together, you know, financial metrics, financial dashboards, scorecards, how to actually craft your ideal type of scorecard, how to measure yourself against the goals that you really want to set for yourself. Because what we're seeing in the industry right now, not just in the online space, but really in any type of business industry is when you are using each other as your benchmark, when you're looking to the sides, you're not focused on on the road. And when you're using other people's accomplishments, like as your yardstick, then it's never going to matter. So we're going to talk about how to define your own goals, how to actually measure what you want and add value, add measurability and quantify those types of things so you can be tracking progress because progress builds momentum and builds confidence. So without further ado, let's get into the conversation with Carlin. Hey, Carlin, welcome to Keep What You Earn. Hi, Shannon. So great to be here. Thanks for having me today. Of course. And uh, could you just say hello to everyone, introduce yourself, who you are and what you do? Yes, absolutely. Hello, all listeners. I'm Carlin Bushman with Carlin Bushman Consulting, and I serve female entrepreneurs in the product and service-based industries. We really focus on not only starting your business, but really setting you up for success and staying in business for the long term. And tell me about that mission, though, because I I know we talked a little bit about this and I, you know, I was looking through all your content and I was thinking, she's right. There's actually, you know, a big need for more of that, especially for female entrepreneurs. Can you go into kind of the why behind this business and why you want to serve that particular group? Absolutely. I think. Well, I know what has recently stood out for me are the statistics that are in the space of female entrepreneurs and two statistics really are glaring for 2023. And that would be the number of female entrepreneurs that actually hit six figures. That statistic is 31%. So if you look at all the female entrepreneurs who start their business and stay in business, 31% actually make it to the six figures. If you go beyond that, the female entrepreneurs that start and stay in business past half a million really is scaled down to 10%. And it is so important as we're looking at women in this space starting your business, the barriers to entry are not great. They are easy to get into, but it's the staying in business. It's what you need to get grounded when you set your goals and you grow. And it has become a passion of mine to just continue to move that statistic up into the right. And what do you think are the major, we'll say, factors that contribute to either those who are rising to the top or maybe the, like why that statistic is what it is, you know, what are some of the factors that you're seeing that contribute to that? Shannon, I think this goes to a lot of what you provide your listeners, you know, throughout the course of your podcast and your incredible wealth of information. 
Financials, knowing your numbers. As you might guess, I measure everything. Um, spreadsheets are my love language. And I look at all the metrics inside of your business. And then really, you have to key in on the ones that are actually going to move your business during that particular time um, to the next level. So measuring everything and having a really good understanding of your financials is very, very important. As you know, they tell a story, right? They help you make decisions in your business. They help you identify where you have opportunities, right? Or where do you cut your losses, whether it's the profit of a program or a product. So I really think that getting into the weeds a little bit on your numbers is really important, but even taking a step back, understanding the terminology that actually supports those numbers and just the educational part. And to me, it's educating women in the space of their financials is invaluable. I agree. And I think that It's something that was overlooked for so long in terms of education, especially for women, and assumed that we maybe women didn't need to know this information or it just wasn't a big focus area. And I always love to ask this to especially women who, similar to me, you have a corporate background, right? But then moved into entrepreneurship. and, And so do I. What was your first exposure, you know, growing up to entrepreneurship and how it kind of affected you and how you kind of use that to drive your career or your aspirations going forward financially? That's a great question. And Shannon, that is a question I rarely, rarely get. So thank you for asking that because it's, it's very interesting to, to reflect on that, right? I mean, it's where we are today. And to your point, yes, coming through corporate, having all that industry knowledge and small business knowledge to apply to females' businesses today has been priceless. I'm so glad for all of that experience. However, Back to your entrepreneurship question. First of all, I don't even know if the word entrepreneurship was really a thing when I first decided or thought about that opportunity. In reflection, the first time entrepreneurship really stood out in my youth was when I decided to sell pumpkins from our farm on the side of a road so I could purchase my first 10-speed bike. And looking back, I guess that was entrepreneurship at its earliest stages. I love that. I think everyone can relate to that. Who hasn't had like a lemonade stand or tried to, you know, do babysitting, dog walking, uh, something, especially our generation, probably like going door to door and asking the neighbors if they need help with something like it comes down to that. Right. And I I just like those fond memories of the first thing you saved up for. Can you tell me, you told me a little bit about this before. So I wanted to, to have listeners here, you know, what was the motivation for that? Well, that is interesting. Also, we lived in a very rural community in Wisconsin. And um, by selling pumpkins to buy my first 10 speed, I could not wait to make that purchase. Why? Because I was tired of asking for rides to go to friend's house or depending on everybody else and their schedules to get me to where I wanted to go. So by the purchase of a bike, I could actually get on the bike and go where I wanted to go at the times I wanted to go. So you could say there was a level of freedom in the entrepreneurship space for me to be able to purchase that first 10 speed bike. And even now, as I reflect on that, and I haven't thought about that for years in something inside of me gets very excited about the fact that I could actually create my own economy and then have that freedom to use that money for what I wanted to use it for at that point. I would like to ask the same question to you. Ooh, that's a good one. So I, So it's funny because I remember the first thing I saved up for, which was my first PlayStation one. So I was like, so excited. I got to buy a hundred dollar PlayStation. Like it was a huge deal. It was a (laughs) hundred dollars. And I was like, I'm going to buy this thing. I'm going to save up for weeks to to buy this. And um, I was, I think nine years old. Uh, So that was a lot of money for a nine or 10 year old to, to have to save up. But what's funny is I didn't get an allowance growing up. I, my, my parents didn't believe in allowances, but I also didn't like to work. So it was kind of this, this agreed upon <laughs> thing that Shannon's not going to get much money, but Shannon's not going to do much around the house. So I, I learned at a very young age that you get money by working. That was like the initial, right? The initial thing. So I would start trying to find ways to work, but I actually kind of cheated the system. And this is my dad is my dad would pay me when he lost bets to me. So we, I actually... <laughs> It was instilled in me to gamble (laughs) and win. But what's so funny is I would take these like, I'm like, as long as I can be the one to win this thing, 
I get money for, I actually learned, I guess if I'm unpacking this, I switched from, I get money from working to, I get money for, for outsmarting. So I would bet my dad on these things. I'm like, I'll bet you a dollar. I'll bet you $5. And then I'd be right because we're all, we're both very competitive. And my dad would be like, you're on. And then he would actually pay up if I won. And it was actually funny because I remember making a lot of money when I was a kid from winning bets with my dad. So it it would be, it's it's such a weird life lesson to learn, but I think in, in a weird way, it also, it's why I'm also comfortable with not everything has to come from, you know, manual labor and time is money. And a dollar is based on how much you physically work. It can be based on how good you are at doing other things, building wealth or what you've invested to become smarter about how you earn money. So who knows? Shannon, that's brilliant. And I'm sure you've seen in business build a better mousetrap. And that's exactly exactly what you did. You took that knowledge and the value. And this goes to just dropping right in. This goes to exactly your example of we get really hung up with the money mindset, right? Charging for our services or, you know, making sure like, what is everybody else charging? Does that feel good? Does that feel right? And the whole money mindset is a whole nother conversation that I am sure you've had on your podcast before and you will continue to have on your podcast episodes. Oh, it's moving never forward. ending, never right. ending. And because, because it's always going to be a thing and something that we all struggle with myself included, like nobody, I feel like nobody's immune from some type of money story that could be potentially holding them back. Right. And we all have to remember people will always charge less than you and people will always charge more than you, but it's Shan and your value or my value that we bring to the table. And that's what we have to step into and own and building a better mousetrap back to what you did. You found a better way to make the money that you wanted to buy the PlayStation. And you kept revisiting that and revisiting that and revisiting that until you actually made that work. And I I love that story. So it's clearly served you well. Yeah. And for the record, guys, I don't go to the casino. That did not instill (laughs) another, that did not, although my first toy was a a toy slot machine. (laughs) Um, My uncle used to work at Foxwoods Casino, context, but I, I, I was never, uh, I never have been and never will be a big gambler. So that did not instill in me, but I think it was a, my dad being a business owner and you know, he knew that a good, a good hard day's work was valuable, but he also knew that I have to reward her for outsmarting me because that's eventually going to, I want her to pursue that pursue like outsmarting or frankly, I think entrepreneurship is built out of, and, and, you know, this is going to sound funny, but it's built out of understanding laziness yeah, or how to make things easier for people or how to lower barriers or how to, um, as my mentor put it, he says, entrepreneurship is bettering the human condition solving a problem. Right. And and to go along with that, let's talk about how we talk about women in business, building longevity, building sustainability in their businesses. And I think that part of it is staying in touch with how is your business bettering the human condition as opposed to how are you working your tail off to build a business? And that's the biggest thing is like, what is the actual value, right? Right. And I, and I think we can take that and, and do this full circle, right? So yeah. Shannon, you do what you do and you charge what you charge and people pay the prices to be part of your community, your organization, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And I want you to stay in business because if you're staying in business, then I get to be a guest on your podcast, right? Because if you go out of business, you may not have the podcast, right? So I get to be on your podcast. And because I get to be on your podcast, Now I've got visibility and I'm a guest on your podcast and I promote your podcast. And now my audience has another opportunity to listen to a valuable asset because I'm staying in business. So that helps me, right? So what we have to think about is that money mindset and that circular economy. So if you stay in business, I stay in business. If I stay in business, my team stays, they have, they're in business, they have a job, they get to do what they want, and then they get to go spend their money where they want, or I get to use my business funds and investments in keeping what I earn and reinvesting in my company to hire a PR agency or to hire a digital marketing agency or to do a rebranding. So now I'm paying somebody else. And I think what we have to remember is we get really caught up in the scarcity mindset, the entrepreneurship side. And if we start to really reframe that to say, I'm going to pay your prices because I want you to stay in business because if you're in business, then I am. And now it becomes a circular economy that we get to all continue to level up and then level up together. And it, it becomes less of 
negotiating price points and more of serving others to serve yourself, to serve others, to grow your business, to serve others, to grow your business. Yep. I totally agree. It's a constant flow of the economy too. It comes back around. And when you're contributing into that, I feel like uh, in my opinion, there's nothing more fulfilling. I agree. I agree. And from a grounding standpoint, what we like to cover a lot uh, within my team and how we serve our women is the four pillars. And like I, I touched on right out of the gates, the financials, you have to understand your financials. You have to have those metrics. I love dashboards. If there's nothing else, if you take nothing else away, and I know you speak to this all the time, and I love how well aligned we are there, um, measuring the important metrics inside of your organization or your company, right? And then following that, know your tech, your tech. How is your technology helping you? How is it supporting you? How are you not working for technology, but letting technology work for you? Um, That's a big factor, right? Offloading some of those things that can be shifted from tech solutions versus manual solutions. Uh, the third piece we walk through is marketing. As you know, every day, sales, focused on sales. How are you serving? How are you growing? And how are you converting to sales? And again, that's another measurement piece. And then the last piece is, is management. Fourth and final, and, and these can rearrange in any order of priority, but fourth and final is management. Management of your time, management of delegation, and ma- management of your team and who's your next hire. So really getting grounded. Yeah. And the, uh, I want to focus too on, if we go back to the financials, right? Cause we've got the four pillars, got financials, technology, marketing, and management, which is basically the dimensions of which you're, you build a thriving business. I look at it almost like if your business is the human body, here are your like macronutrients, right? So here are the different things that are going to feed your body and make sure that you're healthy. And if we unpack the financials, I want to go back to your point about measuring what you want to grow, measuring your metrics, and give our listeners some tangible tips on how they can actually build a, some type of structure. Maybe they're, they're not ready to hire Shannon as their CFO yet, but they want to become their own CFO in some right and be able to actually monitor and maintain these metrics. What are some of the ways that you can coach uh, business owners through how to actually get started by identifying and measuring their metrics. Absolutely. Well, I think first and foremost, set, set yourself up a dashboard and, and it, it'll start very simple. Like don't overthink that. Just start somewhere, just get started. And it can be as simple as writing down right now today, what were your sales in your product or service-based business for January? And where did those sales come from? Was it, if you're in a service-based industry, is it a program? Is it a subscription? Is it a mastermind? Whatever those are, whatever they are. And don't have seven of them. Hone in on four offerings, you know, or five at the most, but really hone in on your programs. If you're a product-based company, are they from direct-to-consumer? Are they wholesale? Are they, again, subscription opportunities? Are they trade shows? Whatever those are. Take January and February and drop in your sales numbers. That's such a great point, place to start. And then secondary to that, we start to touch in on certain metrics such as, to keep it really simple, how many email subscribers do you have? Just add that as a line in your dashboard. How many email active subscribers do you have? And what are your targets there? And that's both service and base, service and product based, right? And and you can build out this dashboard. But the reason I'm saying start really simple and just start with sales, start with your email list, right? And maybe take one more metric that you would find important. If you're in a product-based business, what is your average order value? That's a really good number. I know, Shannon, you've talked about lifetime value of a client, right? Mm -hmm. That's a really good number in the service base. So if you're in product, average order value. If you're in service, lifetime value of a customer. Stop there. Just stop. Because if you start to look back from 2022 and do this month over month over month, and on the same dashboard, do 2023, It's nice to have them all in one place because you'll be able to see the ebbs and flows of your business, the months, the quarters, and then where do you put your horsepower? If your sales drop like a rock in August, then let's not double down on August. If your sales like go crazy in October, double down on October because it's not going to be like pushing a boulder up a hill. It's going to be like rolling a boulder along a path. But if you're going to double down on sales in August when August is terrible, you're now pushing a boulder up a hill. Why do that to yourself? Give yourself that grace. Yeah. Do something different. Yeah, you have to understand the business's behavior, 
You have to know, yes. like, and anticipate these things. This is why for us, a cash flow forecast is so powerful for our clients because we look at, well, what are the the seasonability factors? What are the, what is the behavior coming up? What's coming down the pike in terms of external things that will happen? And we try to, we try to do a lot of planning, but what is I think underappreciated by a lot of business owners is that dashboard of how am I doing? Like, what is my financial weigh in look like, you know, I compare it to blood work. When when you get your blood work back, and you're like, what the hell does any of this mean? Because <laughs> I go, I have the numbers, but is that good? And you have to wait for your doctor to tell you like, what's good and what's not, but you just have the metrics in front of you. And I go, that's how business owners feel. I think when they get their financial statements, they're like, okay, that's a number. What do you want me to do with that information? Right? Like, what? <laughs> that is a right. standalone number. Let's talk about how can business owners establish meaning behind these metrics or connect it to a bigger meaning and make sure that they're they're actually passionate about measuring these things. Right. So it, and, until you measure it, you don't know, right? And I love your blood work right. analogy. Absolutely. Set a baseline. That's why you have to do the work. And that's why I encourage business owners to actually fill out the numbers themselves. Yes, you can get it from your bookkeeper. You can get it from your accountant. Absolutely. but fill out these numbers, you know, at the end of basically for this month, March 31st, you can go in and actually look at your numbers and see what they are. Put those in that dashboard. When you physically do the work yourself, you actually look at it a little bit closer, right? So to answer your question, what do the numbers really mean? That be, that's part of the education. And that is so critical. Don't be afraid to ask those questions. Here are my numbers. What, what should I really be looking at? Ask, ask, be open about asking for help and understanding. You have so many resources out there and we are as a group, always happy to help you. You know, there's, there's plenty of networks and there's plenty of communities. Just ask the question. Don't feel like you have to know it all and until you ever ask the question. You, you aren't going to know all these things. So I encourage you to be able to do that first and then go out and look at some of your industry benchmarks. Why wouldn't you, right? You don't have to reinvent right. the wheel. Go, go out and see what's an average, even from a profitability standpoint, right? Your first year, second year, third year, if you're paying yourself, what is a good profitability for my company at this stage to look at? Okay, there's a benchmark. That's fine. Look at a benchmark and use that as a tool. Yep. Absolutely. And you can also, you know, you can look at peers, you can look at, you know, other factors to be considered there. And, and let's talk about like what metrics, because I know that there, there are financial metrics that are very hard, measurable and obtainable from financial statements. But do you recommend tracking any other metrics that are more qualitative or more, uh, well, let's say less structured? You know, other what other metrics are there, let's say besides profit margin or you know, the, the number of subscribers, is there anything else that you're looking at that may be, uh, I don't know, less quantifiable. Okay. I'm going to actually give a metric that this, this actually was an aha moment with a client I had recently. This is a good story. So I get on a call with uh, a team member from this client every week. And one of the metrics that I have her drop into a spreadsheet is email subscribers, active and just subscribed. And the difference is those who accept the marketing versus those who are just transactional in this scenario, mm -hmm. right? So the transactional ones, usually let's say the number is 5,000 and the subscribe is 3,000. We measure this every, every week. We got on a call re recently and all of a sudden the active or the marketing subscribers dropped by half. We're like, there is no way we just lost half of our marketing email subscribers. There's no way they all unsubscribe. That is nearly impossible. It was a glitch in the CRM. Had we waited until the next month, the end of month, the next quarter or ever, we would have never discovered that glitch in the CRM. And we would have been continuously sending out emails and wondering why our sales had dropped or why there was an open rate of X or why we were losing momentum in our online, our online sales, right? So that is a metric that I would have never guessed to constantly be reviewing. But until you start looking at that, we were lucky to catch it in a short amount of time, went back to the CRM and we could give them seven days worth of data to review versus 45 days had we not discovered it, right? So now you're closing the gap. We wasted less time and money researching why that happened. We were able to provide all the details and they, fi they fixed the problem. 
that that yeah. was something I would have never guessed. And I would have never considered that a financial metric until I realized that would have, that would have become a financial metric because we would have had a drop in sales and we would not have known why. Exactly. You you got ahead of a, that, that's a preventable thing. Like that's a kind of a prevention control we call in the audit world of like, got ahead of that before it became reactive and had, had to investigate why something happened as opposed to what could happen if this perpetuates. So that's really cool. Um, I'm going to give an example too of one with my CFO client that I thought of where one of her goals, and we always, we always start with the goals, like what are your actual goals? And then how do we measure progress towards those goals in different ways? And one of the goals was, I want to spend more time with my daughters. So I say, okay. And instead of now, of course, heightened sales, heightened profit enables you to do that so that you can hire out and outsource. Right. And we get stuff off her plate. But beyond that, I said, what I want you to do is I want you to do one of two things, depending on how, you know, how much spreadsheets are your love language. And that was either track the amount of time you're working versus spending time with family and actually track the progress of that. I said, or make it a habit to do a scorecard for yourself every week and give yourself like a one to 10 score of how well did I balance work and family this week? And I said, I just want you to create a measurement around that, whether that be actually managing time on your calendar, measuring hours, which a lot of people don't like to do because I mean, I think we're all like PTSD from corporate America. If you ever had to do a timesheet. So <laughs> we're like, no more timesheets, but if you can't do a time audit and you just don't want to do that, then I would say at least give yourself a score. Find a way to score keep yourself on the things that matter most to you and be honest with yourself and then start looking at patterns. Maybe something goes down and you're like, well, I didn't work out that week. Or something goes up and you realize that there's actually a connection between your behaviors and the scores. And that's more than just the financials, but I think it all ultimately relates to it. Would you agree? Do you ever take that type of approach? Absolutely. And I have not thought about scoring my time that way. And I love that. And I think I would add into that what I like to call is CEO time, right? As, yeah. the, as the CEO of your business, I can get really into the details and be a human doing versus a human being, right? So instead of being a human doing for that week, I need to be a human being and also a CEO. So the CEO block time I would also probably add that to my scorecard. So I love your scorecard idea, both in, and there's those, those areas, there's friends, there's family, there's CEO time, there's fitness, there's six categories and scoring yourself in those. I think that's a great, because what we don't realize is that time out of the business is actually absolutely going to impact our top line when we go back into the business. It opens up that space to be able to have those ideas, that creativity. And we, you could even call it, you know, space to be creative. That could be another scorecard. Yeah. And, and it's, it sounds so funny because a lot of people will go, why does CFO care about that score for me? And I go, because I want to know, I want to know where you're at. Like, I want to know where you're at in your business, where if you're like seriously uncomfortable with where you're at in terms of how you're spending your time, that's going to be a major focus area. Or like you said, if it's, if fitness is a really big issue or, or like it's something you want to do more of, I go, okay, like, let's talk about, you know, it's almost like life coaching for your business through these different metrics. And it's really important to keep in mind, like, what are the different dimensions you want to be scored on that you want to improve on? And, and, and part of that process too, and I want to, I want to talk through this with you is using feedback and creating awareness around the, when you're measuring these dashboards, let's use the email subscribers again, as an example, right. And going, mm -hmm. Oh, you know, sub subscribership is going down. So we, we start with the basics of measuring the metrics Mm -hmm. Then we notice patterns in the metrics and we go, subscribers are going down. Now, I'm going to go into my accountant brain and say like the, the quote unquote bookkeeper says, here's, here's the data. The quote unquote accountant says subscribers are going down. And then for me, the CFO says your email content starting to suck or whatever it is, right? They'll go, they'll, it, it's a different layer of the why Let, let's talk about how to unpack these metrics and go through what are some of the things that maybe a pattern you've seen in a client and how you dissected a root cause or treated the underlying issue. Right. Well, and I think you've just laid out the scenario perfectly, right? So we, we have the higher level issue and then we break it down, you break it down, you break it down. And then you look through 
And this is where delegation and creativity and team really, really starts to rise up, right? Now you start to set the challenges and you involve your team and or you may be a solopreneur and have no team and that's okay too. But now maybe you think about, okay, I can't do this. Email email, um, content has... um, not been as um, exciting. And and maybe it's because you're wearing too many hats and it's time to make a decision to outsource that to somebody who is really talented in that space. And that's a decision you have to make. So now you get down to the root cause and you see that you've seen the graph go, you know, down and, you know, decline over time. You have to put some things in place. And one of those things and those ideas would be, you're giving yourself some time and space to think about, do I hire somebody to do this for me? Do I, you know, like do hire a freelancer? Do I what? You have to come up with some solutions as the CEO of your company. You take it down to the most granular level and then you start testing it and you start to put some goals behind that as well. And you do some AB split testing. So now we're getting really gritty into some of the details of the email marketing as an example here. But until you leave yourself some space to look at the number, and then go from the bookkeeping to the accountant to the CFO to you to making a decision. You don't know any of this until you start measuring it. And that's how you make a change, right? So then that would be one of the solutions. Okay, let's look at your email. You can't possibly fit this into your schedule. And when you do fit it into your schedule, you're multitasking. You're sending out an email with no rhyme or reason and subscribership is dropping. Okay, own it. That's the feedback and make a decision and pivot on that. Yeah. And let's talk about what's the cost of not measuring. Oh, the cost of sales, right? I mean, cost of your sanity, cost of growth of inside of your company, putting your, like not measuring something because what you don't want to know what the story is that it's going to tell you for better or worse. It's great for bragging rights. And then it's also great for feedback and feedback is a gift. So measuring something And getting the feedback through the metrics inside of your organization is just the biggest gift ever. And then asking those pointed questions. And sometimes we don't know what we don't know. So Mm -hmm. until I decide to say, I'm going to start to measure engagement on my social media channels. Wow. I may have 10,000 followers, but my engagement rate stinks. That's not going to help any conversions. So now you put into place what we just talked about with email, right? Followers, great. Engagement, not great. Content, not great. Time to outsource, great. Or one of those key areas, right? Why, what can make the change that's going to help my business? You don't know that until you start to look at the numbers. And the cost is, like I said, frustration, loneliness in the CEO role or the founder's role. It's hard and entrepreneurship is hard. Sacrificing your personal time because you're thinking about why, why, why is this happening? Well, if you if you start to get the numbers, in the metrics, you will start to get to that point. So I think there's a lot that goes into that. Yeah, I agree. I think the the cost of not knowing is, and not to mention, I, I, the first thing I think of is years. It will cost you years because it will cost you years to find out the long way what what the numbers could have told you. And you won't know until you feel the pain point. Here's my other analogy. You don't know you're gaining weight until your jeans don't fit. Right. Right. And then you're like, shoot, (laughs) how long has this been going on for? (laughs) Right, right. Yeah. So your your analogies are great because they're all very relevant to the mind and the body and the health of you as a human, Mm -hmm. which would be the health of your company as well. So we're talking, you brought up blood blood work, right? Setting your benchmarks and measuring your blood work. You brought a feeling fit inside and out, and that's getting into into the, your favorite pair of jeans or not, you know, through COVID, I think most of us were not putting on jeans. So there was that, but I think that's, that's great. And I think as part of entrepreneurship, it is that association between health of who you are and just like your one client, a scorecard on the, on all those fronts makes you a healthier human, makes you a healthier company. It's inevitable. I completely agree. And I think that let's just talk about for a second, the mindset aspect of this, like anyone who has an aversion to this, because they, they don't want to, maybe they just don't want to see what's out there. They don't want the exposure to it. Maybe they're, they think it will stress them out 
or maybe they're going to t- attach too much self-worth to these metrics or attach too much value to them where now they're going to judge themselves or maybe have shame around these numbers. Can you kind of talk through how your clients maybe have navigated through that and how you're able to, uh, to kind of help with that? I think it's, um, I don't think, I know it's a reframe. It's hard. Mm. And it's a muscle. So let's revert back to the body analogy, right? It's a muscle. It's a muscle like doing really healthy breathing, right? So breath work is important, right? So it's a muscle. It's a muscle on, and I'm working, full disclosure, I'm, I'm working through 40 days of that right now. And that is the mindset meeting exactly whether it's imposter syndrome Um, the stress of not really wanting to see what the numbers are going to tell me and how am I going to make some decisions on that. So I think it is constantly looking at it it, and putting yourself in that space that is the discomfort or the comfort and the discomfort. So you look at it one time, you have the shock value, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't even look at that again and take a break from it. And then you go back to it and it doesn't feel as bad. And then you go back to it and it doesn't feel as bad. It's like getting up and you're going to go run a half a mile and you're like, oh my God, that was really, really hard. And then you go back and run a half mile a week later and you're like, okay, okay, that is what it is. I still don't feel like I could run the marathon yet. And then it's these baby steps and you have to give yourself first is it's exposure, shell shock, frustration, and disassociating that to progress. So now my whole mission is progress over perfection. Just let go of the perfection, easier said than done. Once again, it is a muscle. And looking at progress and celebrating those milestones, I am a huge fan of celebrating the milestones. The first time you decide to set up your dashboard and start your metrics, that's a milestone right there. You have to document your milestones and go back to the playbook of these milestones, big or small. Remember the milestones. Remember the first time you did a podcast. Remember the first time you were on a podcast. Remember the first time you hosted your first podcast. And look at what you're doing now today. Your content is extraordinary. Like it's fabulous. And I take notes every time I'm on your podcast or listening. So I think with that being said, same thing. It helps you disassociate the personal side, except for embracing the growth. Think about how much you are growing by measuring your business. It's a huge step. Definitely is. And it's, I, I always say that if you really want to build confidence, you look at how far you've come and you actually look at your track record. You look at the footprints behind you of how far you've traveled as opposed to how far you've yet to go. And I think that when you really reflect on how much you've accomplished in in a short period of time, especially as entrepreneurs, we're very action oriented and very much like on to the next thing, solving the next problem without realizing like, wow, if I made a list of everything I've done that I'm proud of, it's actually a very extensive list. I actually started doing that. Uh, when I first started my business, I made a, a hype list of little things like little, you know, when you're a kid and like, they'll do like the notches on the door when you grow. Yeah. Like, remember when you were this tall, remember when you were this tall and we did this in a way I said, I kind of want to have like a trail of breadcrumbs behind me of writing down when I did these things I thought were a big deal at the time that now I'm like, what do you mean? Like created my first lead magnet. Like it's so silly. Like it's, it's like looking at your macaroni kindergarten painting and going really, but then you go, I was, I was really proud of that. Like I was really proud of that when I did it. And it kind of takes you back to those moments and appreciate them. And I think that that's a really big part of it too, is equal, equal parts forward planning and reflection, not dwelling on the past, but using it to create momentum for yourself. And I think to not let go of that, and I'm as guilty as anyone by not documenting my milestones on a regular basis, big or small, but you go back the days where it's the hardest, go back and just look at it. And you're right. The fact that you just reflected on the macaroni art or your first lead magnet or your first lead magnet that you, you had a hundred email addresses because of that lead magnet. Wow. That was so spectacular, right? And Mm -hmm. something that's always resonated with me, there's a reason in cars that the windshield is bigger than the rear view mirror, right? So the rear view mirror is set to reflect and not dwell. The windshield is to look ahead, right? So you're, you're looking ahead, but yet you should still have a moment of reflection of where you've come from, like where you've been up until this point. The fact that you started a business and you came up with this fabulous idea because you saw something in the market that would benefit from your idea, your concept, your product, that is a milestone and a huge accomplishment. So we have to remind ourselves. And then of course, looking at, you know, the growth from there. Yeah. And I think, uh, 
we want to make sure that we are, you know, watering that plant, helping it thrive and doing all we can to keep it alive and, and going in the, in the, in the name of service too, because as much as it can be tiring, as much as it can be exhausting at times, I think when we keep our eye on the prize in terms of the mission, the why, and we use this feedback to help drive improvement towards that goal, as opposed to looking at it as things taking us down or dragging us back, it it just creates so much momentum forward and it can really lead to amazing results. So I really wanted our listeners to take away that core message from today is that you really can using the the right amount of the metrics, the data, but also just the mindset and advice around it. Like you can literally do anything. I feel like the sky's the limit. Absolutely. And Shannon, if nothing else, the 31% that hit six figures today, let's make that 32% tomorrow and 33%, you know, in 2025 or whatever the case is, let's move the metric. And by having a good foundation measuring the insights inside of your company, working the muscle and giving yourself the grace to have that scorecard to keep you on track. I think it's inevitable and you will, you can do whatever you want to do. I love it. So Carlin, how can folks find out more about working with you, your consulting practice, or just getting more education from you online right now? Absolutely. We have a ton of free resources on my website at carlinbushmanconsulting.com. I am on LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, of course, all the social handles under Carlin Bushman Consulting. I have lots of opportunities to reach out to me, whether it's a free 20-minute discovery call. I'm always happy to talk to entrepreneurs and where they are in their journey. And then, of course, we have some courses and classes coming up that are very, very small, intended to really get gritty inside of your business. Amazing. Thank you so much for coming on the show today, Carlin. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Shannon. It's been a delight. Do you want to explore more about the topics discussed in today's episode? Or maybe you have specific questions on how to apply what you learned. If so, check out the Keep What You Earn community. Join other listeners, entrepreneurs, and experts and get the support you need to get out of overwhelm and into action. Click on the link in the show notes to join now for free and start maximizing the value you get from each and every episode. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating and review on your podcast platform. This small action goes a long way for podcasters to get our message heard by more business owners just like you. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to information about our guests and ways to get in touch with me. We'll see you on the next episode.